I want people to play our new game and say like, wow, I haven't seen COD change so much since Modern Warfare. I haven't seen COD change so much since Modern Warfare. COD changed so much since Modern Warfare. COD changed so much. COD changed so much. COD changed so much. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. Well, here we are. The future, which is now the past that once was the present. Is it Call of Duty? Yes! Has it changed? No. But I want you to keep this quote in mind as I finally get my hands dirty with Infinite Warfare. This was Infinity Ward's shot at redemption following the travesty known as Ghosts. By reading various statements from the devs, it's clear they envisioned Infinite Warfare as the start of the next generation. A new sub-series fancier than Captain Price's mustache. Let's do it, boys. Treyarch outshines us no more. Well... Looks like there's been a change of plans. Infinite Warfare became one of the most notorious COD games faster than you can say new dog model. But why the hate, you ask? Oh boy, Activision done screwed the pooch on this one. I remember it like it was yesterday. We all speculated and joked, what's next, Call of Duty in space? And then the trailer dropped, as did everyone's jaw, and the internet caught on fire. This, this, this is not okay. This needs to stop now. Everybody and their mother wanted to hate this game right from the get-go. And it was that reputation that kept me away from this game for years. Until Mason here tweeted me 155 times. Reception to the new futuristic direction had always been lukewarm at best. Every title has had some mixed reception and controversy, sure, but not to this degree. Infinity Ward made YouTube history by posting the second most disliked video on the platform. Congratulations, you played yourself. Battlefield absolutely torched Call of Duty in 2016 and 17, but Activision couldn't stop there. Hey boss, me and the boys are kind of worried about how this new direction is going to go over with the fans. Do you think we should launch this trailer, see how people react, and then decide if we want to couple it with the Modern Warfare remaster? I'm not paying you to think, butthole. And I haven't even brought up the egregious microtransactions. All this bad press blended together resulted in a drop of 50% in sales from BO3. Infinite Warfare isn't even in the top 10 best-selling games in the series. I had trouble finding exact figures, but from what I've seen, every other title except the OGs sold more copies than Infinite Warfare. If you don't get what your boy Act Man is laying down, everyone hated this game. But was it all warranted? Is Infinite Warfare truly worthy of its notoriety? Was the multiplayer that bad? How about zombies? And I've heard surprisingly good things about the campaign. Does this game have any redeeming qualities? Well, let's drop a dislike, hop in our jackal, and fly into space straight into this. But before we do that, I just wanted to say that- A command post is now under hostile control. We can't keep losing command posts. Oh no, my identity's being stolen? I have to do something about this. Oh wait, I already did. I installed private internet access. Take that, mom. Take that! Private Internet Access is exactly what it sounds like, a world-leading VPN with over 30 million downloads worldwide. If you had that many COD points, you could unlock half of the weapons in Infinite Warfare. Private Internet Access can unblock all region restrictions, allowing you to watch any video on YouTube, as well as anything on Netflix, Amazon Prime, or Hulu. Nobody wants Big Brother, aka Xfinity, to have control of your data and to know every little secret about you. So use Private Internet Access to hide your IP address and data. Everyone has been working from home these days, and that means the scammers and hackers are too. So there's no better time to secure your important information than right now and with private internet access. The app is available for all platforms, and a single subscription will allow you to protect up to 10 devices. And you want to know the best part? Your boy 
got the hookup. For less than $3 a month, you my friend can rest easy. But only if you use the link in the description and on screen. Doing so will get you an additional three free months. PrivateInternetAccess.com slash TheActMan. And if you're not satisfied, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you, Private Internet Access, for sponsoring this video. And now, our feature presentation. What we need to understand about this game is the context of its release. After Black Ops 3, Treyarch was quickly becoming the new Infinity Ward, with many fans considering them to be a better developer over the studio that made this franchise what it is. For years, it was Treyarch copying Infinity Ward. But now there was competition. Infinity Ward needed to step up. Ironically, they copied much of Treyarch's formula in lieu of their own. A pick 10 system, zombies instead of spec ops. Even the movement mechanics are virtually identical to BO3. Infinity Ward must have been sad by the reception ghosts got, because they canceled plans for a sequel. You'd have been a hell of a ghost. But that's not gonna happen. There ain't gonna be any ghosts. Maybe that affected their confidence and they simply latched onto what Treyarch was doing. Infinite Warfare didn't change the formula of the time. In fact, it actually improved upon Advanced Warfare and Ghosts in many ways. But it doesn't matter how much Febreze you spray on a pile of goat shit, it's still a pile of goat shit. Now allegedly, Taylor Kurosaki overheard IW employees talking about how cool the space mission in Ghosts was and they quickly used that as the basis for Infinite Warfare. Indeed, the concept of COD in space is pretty cool, but having a cool premise and executing it are completely separate. My point is to illustrate how lost Infinity Ward appeared with this entry. These were the dark years of Call of Duty. Enough jerking around my boost rig, time to check out the campaign. Infinite Warfare is set in a distant future where Earth's resources are almost depleted. Because of population growth and other generic sci-fi reasons, the world nations formed the UNSC. I mean, the UNSA. Basically just a military group tasked with enforcing law and rule on the outer colonies. Space Police. At some point, a group known as the Settlement Defense Front broke from the UNSC because they smelled bad or... It's not explained at all. The SDF are bad guys who... How would I describe them? We know nothing about their language, their history, or what they look like. But we can assume this. They stand for everything we don't stand for. The sun, the moon, and the stars would have disappeared long ago had they happened to be in the reach of... Predatory human hands. In a game published by Activision? That's what you call ironic. Anyways, the single player starts the off new with- new frontier offered the promise son of, a, of a new beginning. <sighs> Hold up. Stop! I've had enough of this. Why is it? Why, in the name of the Nine Divines, do so many COD campaigns start the same way? I swear, it's always just some dude talking about war. My sons, let me tell you about the ghosts and war. Greetings, friend. Me and my best friend, Will, are going to war. Dear Paul, I write this with a heavy heart to inform you I'm going to do the dishes later. Just kidding. I'm headed to war. Are we just going to pretend like the intros for COD 4 and Black Ops don't exist? Why you always be explaining the backstory and setting to me, huh? Don't tell me how the settlement defense front broke from the earth. Just show it to me. Have me play through the whole secession. Make parallels to the American Civil War. Okay, I'm done. So we take control of a guy named Wolf on one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. Pretty unique setting. I bet it's gonna look like crap and oh, hot diggity, this game is gorgeous. It's beautiful. Infinity Ward fully commits to a sci-fi space aesthetic with levels that take us all over the galaxy. Even go to Mustafar. We fly through asteroid belts to the goddamn moon, around Saturn's rings, Jupiter, we fight inside giant spaceships. Even if you hate COD in space, give the artist some credit, man. Let's take out that weapon, boys. <laughs> Nearly every backdrop and location is stunning. I felt immersed right away. That is, until I was forced to follow some guy like every other COD. 
So the first mission, Rising Threat, is pretty by the books. Little tutorials here and there. Nothing too special. Whoa, whoa, wait! What's this? A boss fight? And it's... fun? No, 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 no. This can't be. The script says I'm not supposed to be having fun. Yeah, this is actually awesome. Got a health bar, I'm shooting it with a laser. So after taking out the giant mech, boom, six more appear. Wolf shoots a giant laser which sends him and his crew out into the barren ice. Everything appears to be a-okay until... Get him up, he needs that. Jonathan Snowington. Looks like winter came after all. Catch your breath, Drew. No! I don't want air. I don't want it. My men need medical. You care about your men? Yes, sir, I do. What? This this is the most cliche thing you could have a villain do at the start. I'm so badass, I kill my own men without looking at them. Just to show you how little I care about human life. That makes me compelling and cool. As dumb as it is, it does lay the foundation for the theme of the story. We'll get into that. So Kit Harrington is pissed about season 8, then unplugs our air and tells his guards Kill me. Save the bullet. What's going on, Kit? You having financial troubles? Yes. Yeah, Jesus! Now that's how you curb stomp someone. But turns out this footage was being broadcast to Lieutenant Reyes and Admiral Reigns, who discuss how to handle the SDF. The two argue over the importance of this mission. Reyes is clearly upset with how the SDF got away. This is the part where I'd normally take my headset off and grab a beer, but the dialogue is great. This is a deliberate act of aggression, Admiral. We should be out there on patrol, not down here throwing confetti. It's well written, intriguing, filled with emotion and personality. Until it's war, the warriors aren't in charge. These people care about what they're doing? It's awesome. Lieutenant Reyes, make no mistake. My instincts, which are aligned indelibly with your own, are that we need to engage. Why don't we, sir? We get the sense that Reyes puts a lot more value on the lives of his men than maybe some others. He's a compassionate leader who may let that interfere with the mission. Again, cliche, but it's executed very well in this story. After the meeting, we're introduced to Reyes' partner and fellow lieutenant, Nora Salter. The two banter back and forth and establish their connection. Take a little R&R today, Reyes. That's an order. You can't give me an order, we're the same rank. You got me there, Lieutenant. Then we walk down a memorial hallway. Not a list you want to make. Peace to the Fallen. The detailed environments and graphics are beautiful. And I love that Infinite Warfare is grounding the story in reality. People die in war and it's tragic. And this celebration scene, do I really need to say anything? I could stare at it for hours. But then we meet up with Ethan, a robot who gives HK-47 a run for his money. This guy's great. Program for combat? Thoroughly, ma'am. Born to kill. Look like you can kick some serious ass. Well, now you're just making me blush, sir. While you're distracted by the charming dialogue, a sinister plot brews. We're shot down. Reyes and the gang fight their way through the war-torn city and capture a dude named Raya taking the fight to space before landing on the Pillar of Autumn. I mean Retribution. The largest ship in the fleet. Turns out the captain who runs it was taken out, and so Lieutenant Reyes is given full command of the ship. Right off the bat, it was clear to me, Infinite Warfare wouldn't be a snooze fest like Ghosts in AW. But let's switch gears for a moment. We need to ask the big question. Is the campaign even fun? At the very least, Infinite Warfare improves on many aspects we saw in Ghosts and AW. It really does feel like an evolution from Advanced Warfare. For one, every mechanic the developers introduce has a purpose. That's right, no stupid one-off gimmicks or heavily scripted linear sequences. Heck, I don't even think there's an on-rails turret section here. That's probably a first for this series. The developers put the power in your hands. Hacking robots is something you can do at any time. It makes the campaign much more dynamic because the player can choose when, where, and how they use the tools they have. 
rather than being forced and told, hey, look up, shoot the grapple hook. Now do it again. 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 We are not slaves to the developer's will. The game still holds your hand, just not as much. You got some cool new gadgets as well, like anti-gravity grenades, seeker bots, deployable cover and drones, and the campaign has some neat enemies. Instead of the typical soldier who pops out of cover every few seconds, Infinite Warfare gives us like robots with shields, guns, and their behavior is unlike regular soldiers. Even when cut in half, they'll claw around trying to get to you, self-destruct. What makes the campaign unique is its focus on three types of missions. Standard boots on the ground, zero G in space, and space battles with the jackal. Oftentimes you'll have a combination of the three in a single level, and the transition is seamless. You'll be pumping dudes full of energy bolts, next moment you hop in a jackal and fly to space to assault the main carrier. Beyond that, Infinite Warfare takes notes from BO2 by giving players side missions they can tackle in any order. Throughout the single player, I felt like I had way more agency over the game than I had in previous titles. Not to mention you can customize loadouts as you unlock new perks, attachments, and weapons. Now space battles are a big highlight. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. Nowhere in COD's history has a game ever committed so hard to something that wasn't traditional. Thankfully, you aren't stuck flying in one direction or on a set path. I can't tell if it's sad or amazing that that's one of the biggest innovations. The Jackal controls pretty well, though it's not realistic. Dogfighting is intense, man. Enemy fighters coming at you, Fox! You've got an enemy on your tail! Do a barrel roll! Let me get a piece of that action, Fox! Taking out the giant ships is satisfying. Here's the problem. The flight mechanics aren't deep enough to warrant being one-third of the game. This ain't no Battlefront 2 space battles or battlefield flight controls. Sometimes these sections are so disorienting it's just a mess of colors, pixels, and gunfire. Then you got the standard boots on the ground type missions which ain't half bad. And then there's zero G levels. You can control your verticality, float up and down at will, grapple onto asteroids, ships, or even enemies. I absolutely adore these sections, but there is some wasted potential. While Infinite Warfare takes a different approach to the types of levels, the campaign unfortunately squanders its true potential, because the level design is still adhering to the linear COD formula. Operation Phoenix is a perfect idea. They put you in this wide open zero G area, asteroids all around, but then they're like, okay, now follow this NPC. What is this, Assassin's Creed? Come on, man, why not put a bunch of soldiers and ships patrolling all over, let me clear them out or make my way to the ship on my own? Doesn't that sound familiar? There are quite a few kick-ass missions, none better than Dark Quarry, where the game takes on a more horror-esque atmosphere. And I gotta say, it works pretty well, investigating this desolate space station, letting the atmosphere creep into the room. I want to see more of this. Despite how much the promotional material emphasized advanced movement, it is laughable, <laughs> like an afterthought. Wall running is used maybe two to three times in the entire campaign. So why is it even here? I didn't expect Infinite Warfare to be as free-flowing as Titanfall, but good lord, you can play this like any other COD in the Boots on the Ground missions. I said it with Advanced Warfare, I'll say it here. The setting is futuristic, the level design is not. The levels are extremely aggravating. Often you'll have like three minutes of combat immediately followed by waiting in an elevator, waiting for a door to open, pressing X to open a door, or waiting for an NPC to unfuck their programming and get on with it. In essence, Infinite Warfare is decent fun, but its stubborn adherence to linearity brings it down. I will say Infinity Ward nailed it with the set pieces at least. Surprise, motherfucker! The ship falls into the water and it's like... Big ass yacht crashes on shore. On boarding missions, sometimes you can shoot the glass out and watch everyone fly out into space. Which brings me to surprise. surprise number two. Infinite Warfare has some of the best transitions I've ever seen. You think that's silly, 
but check out how smooth it goes from gameplay to cutscene. I carry the brain of a human farmer. Holy shit, are you serious? No, ma'am, not at all. <laughs> you got you, Lieutenant. Did not. Normally I wouldn't bother discussing a small detail like this, but I honestly can't think of any other COD that does this. The presentation is buttery smooth, man. Missions typically go like this. Choose what you want to do on this dope map screen. Maybe read up on Pluto for your astronomy test. Customize a loadout from Griff, hop into your Jackal, get briefed on the objective, and then fly your ass out. Some may call this tedious, but me, I call them treasures. I think it's immersive. You really feel like you're gearing up for an epic battle. More than any other COD game, this one shows the inner workings of the military. Space battle missions don't just end, you have to land your jackal, got this cool little robot that braces the impact. If you run out of missiles, another robot flies in and attaches them onto your ship. The Retribution is your hub world, and you can watch news segments just like StarCraft 2 except without the charm and wit, check video and audio recordings, which are written really well, and give backstory on Reyes and the other characters. There's also this board of targets. It seems cool until you beat the game and realize maybe three of them have dialogue. So the gameplay is pretty good. The story starts out strong, introducing all the characters. We get witty banter between them, motivations, establishing shots, showing off the cool locations. The stage is set for a kick-ass adventure. Uh, until the second act starts and the plot doesn't know what to do with itself. There's seven main and nine optional missions. So it's a four hour story stretched to eight. The optional missions are busy work. I mean, sure, we're attacking the SDF, but if you skip these levels, you're not missing out on anything. That's a problem, especially since the pacing gets totally fucked if you play them. Unlike Black Ops 2, which did the same, except it told two different stories in two time periods. This is one of the very, very rare games I've played where the characters are awesome and likable, but the plot sucks ass. With bad or mediocre stories, most times it's the other way around. An interesting plot is ruined by boring characters. Call of Duty protagonists are usually hit or miss. BO3 had some cookie cutter crap. Ghosts went for the silent protagonist, that didn't work. But one thing has remained common, and it's the fresh off the boat main character, who's new to everything and paves the way for endless exposition. But not here. Nick Reyes is a seasoned veteran, the highest ranking playable character in the series. He's confident, poised, motivated, and familiar with war. Playing as him, you feel like a leader, and everyone looks up to you. Supporting you are various minor characters that inhabit the ship, Gator, the Navigator, Omar, a staff sergeant with attitude, Kashima, a light-hearted soldier who accompanies you on missions, and so on. They might not be the deepest characters, but they make it feel like a real military operation. And you learn to care about them. Speaking of which, uh, your XO, is she, you know, available? You know what? I think she is. <laughs> That's good to know. Unfortunately, our main villain, Admiral Koch, has no motivation to speak of. He's presented in the most cliche ways possible obligatory scene of him taunting you over video. Gee, haven't seen that before. It's not the performance, it's the writing. The story is essentially, here are all these people with lives and personality, watch them get killed off one at a time. For every death, the pressure on Reyes to be a great leader gets stronger. Captain's duty is to get his men home alive, Staff Sergeant. No ways, Lieutenant. No ways. Now let's skip to the third act, which has Reyes and crew attempting to destroy the SDF orbital shipyard. They commandeer the Olympus Mons, take care of Koch, and Reyes needs to make sure everyone gets home safe. Along the way, many lives are lost. Sergeant Omar, Kashima, and Ethan, who heroically self-destructs in a manner Vegeta would be proud of. Good luck, Reyes. They're honored, sir. Was all mine, mine. Not gonna lie, I got a little emotional there. When it comes down to it, Reyes infiltrates the space station and knows there isn't a way out. It's the cycle of service and sacrifice, and even Reyes has to take one for the team. His last scene ends on a somber note, 
with the lieutenant drifting in space. His mission successful. The final shot shows Salter paying respects to the memorial we saw at the beginning. As it zooms in, we see the names of personnel who served us on the retribution. We won't be forgotten. The end credits are bittersweet as you listen to audio logs left by your fallen comrades. Is this emotion I'm feeling? While Infinite Warfare's burden of leadership theme lacks all subtlety, I really did come out of the campaign with appreciation. It feels like there was passion behind telling this story. Some of the death scenes are so predictable it's funny. It's good to be in a fight with you, sir. Twelve seconds later. Get her! But it's a classic war story juxtaposed by the unorthodox setting. Warning, playing Infinite Warfare's multiplayer or watching gameplay can have severe side effects, including headache, nausea, dizziness, insomnia, increased weight, loss of appetite, anger, depression, abdominal pain, heart failure, exploding diarrhea, shrunken balls syndrome, and hair loss. Don't bother asking your doctor if Infinite Warfare is right for you, it's not. What is there to say about this multiplayer that hasn't already been said about your mom? My mother? No! As a longtime vet of the series, I can say creating a class has never felt more off-putting in any game before or since Infinite Warfare. I don't even know where to start. It's like sorting through a dumpster to find the smelliest piece of trash. Create a class is overloaded with mechanics. It's a pick 10 system, which you'd think would be good enough, but then you got gun perks and a combat rig with extra perks called traits. You got this payload super weapon in addition to managing salvage and literally hundreds of different prototype weapons with all unique base traits that you have to try and memorize. What is this, an MMORPG? It's like a science project gone awry. Whatever happened to that beautiful simplicity? The COD series has had a long streak with horrible monetization schemes, always greedy, always unnecessary and intrusive. But this, this is the grand mother load of terrible loot box systems. For these reviews, learning the customization can be fun or a chore, but I've never had to do it with 300 goddamn weapons. Gamble for an in-game advantage using real money, log in daily to create a pattern of addiction, buy our DLC model that hasn't changed in the last six years. The loot boxes have so many issues. In a good game, like Modern Warfare 2, the advantages higher level players get come in the form of attachments, perks, and an expanding arsenal all earned through gameplay. You might get lasered from an ACR and think, man, I can't wait to unlock that. In a bad game, the devs say, fuck you, pay us for an advantage. Give me money, money me, money now. You get killed by a prototype gun and think, there's no way in hell I'm gonna grind for that. This system actively discourages new players. It is indefensible. You've earned enough resources for a supply drop. Oh! Oh my fucking god! Creating a class in this series has always been fun, even if the gameplay for some entries was lacking. But Infinite Warfare, hands down, has the worst customization in the franchise. But hey, it's still fun to shoot things, right? WRONG! I despise the weapon designs, sound effects are crap, snipers have the handling of an SMG, ADS time is non-existent, the latency lag and hit detection is out of this world. The lag is in every match. Maybe it wasn't like this at launch, but it basically makes the multiplayer unplayable. Some weapons are kind of cool, but the majority are carbon copies of everything we've seen before. Oh, cool, an AK-47 with energy bolts. This is the future. But wait, it gets worse. Movement. Such a simple concept, yet fundamental part of every video game. Whether you're sprinting with supersonic speed or fat rolling, how a game handles movement is always important. So when you hear the term advanced movement, you think, oh, this is meant to give me more freedom and opportunities in an FPS setting. The appeal is, you can get creative with this. You won't be stuck to whatever lanes and paths the developers create. And that's what you get in Titanfall 2, where every level feels like a playground. And for what it's worth, Black Ops 3 wasn't terrible. 
advanced movement while in a primitive state for COD had a gimmicky appeal. I guess the concept was still fresh at the time, but if you're gonna make a new game with the same movement, you'd expect it to be way more useful, refined, and tuned in line with the map design. You'd expect people to say, Wow, I haven't seen COD change so much since Modern Warfare. But would you look at that? It's the exact same thing. You know, even if you hated Halo 5's movement, at least 343 created their maps to accommodate those abilities. By adhering to the monotonous three-lane design that has poisoned the Call of Duty formula, Infinity Ward simplified movement by forcing players to, you guessed it, go left, middle, or right. The maps are littered with so many kill barriers and invisible walls, a mime would have a mental breakdown trying to play this. Every match is both teams jumping around and flying all over the place in a chaotic mess. And the very second you try to get creative, BAM! For racism. Let's check out some of these maps, shall we? Can I jump up here? No. There's a ladder. Can I jump up? No. Of course not. Let's try wall running over here. All right. So far, so good. Nope. Don't want to go down. Nope. Okay. That didn't work. All right. Can I go up here? Hell no. Well, why does it look like I can? Jump on the building. Come on. Get up there. No. Don't wall run. Get up there. Ugh. How about this catwalk? Can't possibly have an invisible barrier there. You son of a bitch. What about over here? No, of course not. Of course that's a kill barrier. You can't even jump on the ledge, dude. What? Fucking hate this piece of <laughs> All right, let's try jumping up. Oh, okay. Yeah, that kills you. Great. This was play tested. All right, finally, I found something I can wall run on. No! You gotta be shitting me! How did they fuck this up so bad? What? This? This area? Why is there a kill barrier here? Why didn't you cover this up? I can't even jump over this? Are you serious? Alright, this giant truck looks promising. I, I can't jump on the truck? I don't care if I can't get up there. Fuck you, game. I don't give a shit. Get me the fuck up there. Get, get, ah! No wall running here, no wall running there. Go this way, you die. Go that way, you die. Can't jump on this, can't jump on that. Not this, not that, not here, not there, not anywhere. No, don't, stop, can't, go, fuck you, fuck you. By the season's pass. <sighs> now that I've calmed down, the reason people didn't like the futuristic setting is because Call of Duty never actually embraced these new mechanics beyond a surface level. You could make minimal changes, pop these maps into any other COD game without enhanced movement, and it'd be no different. This is what boggles my brain. Look at this dope moon warthog. Why is this not in a level or mode on the surface of the moon where we can drive it around? Why are there no space battles? Where are the zero-g areas? I mean, I'm in disbelief. How could Infinity Ward commit so hard to a futuristic sci-fi aesthetic yet be so terrified to embrace it. Infinite Warfare was afraid of its own shadow. The bottom line, these maps were not designed for the movement that they gave you, and that's why the multiplayer is trash. One last stop on the Infinite Warfare train. When we all heard that Infinity Ward was gonna make yet another Zombies mode, I had some terrible flashbacks. As a studio, they'd struggled in the past to make a side mode as interesting, fun, and replayable as Treyarch. But let me tell you folks, Infinite Warfare Zombies is some straight fire. Spaceland is one of, if not the most detailed, stylish, and interactive environments in COD Zombies history. I'm like a kid at a carnival in this place. There's so much to do, tons of areas to explore. The whole level is filled with mini-games, arcade machines, you can play for tickets, which you can then redeem for prizes. A freaking trap forces the zombies to dance like it's Thriller. Doesn't get more creative than that. Grab tokens, pick up items off the ground, hold up to five perks, get unique equipment like sprinkle pops, a boom box, arcade games and classic Atari games all over the place, teleporters, pack a punch. This is amazing. I love it. It's the game within a game. Seeing how good you can get at some of these arcade machines. There's even a roller coaster ride you can hop into and take a breather from the endless undead. 
I can't stress how incredible the art direction and detail is. This is everything a zombies map should strive to be. It's not too complicated either. While I really enjoy the mode, I have a couple concerns. Uh, one being that this was the fifth COD in a row to have zombies or some kind of survival mode. Also, I don't exactly understand the setting. I mean, this is supposed to be infinite warfare. Why are we using futuristic guns in the 1980s? Despite these minor nitpicks, the allure of taking a break from editing and popping this bad boy in is too strong to resist. So hold up, I'm going to be right back with the conclusion. At the end of the day, I know I'm shouting into the void about Infinite Warfare, but I think it's important to revisit older games and analyze their impact on the series. This game was ravaged by the fans, yet I feel like many people hated this game for the wrong reasons. But it's not our fault that we didn't embrace the setting, because it wasn't sold to us. Yet I don't think the setting and campaign deserved the backlash it got. The multiplayer did, but the style and aesthetic is awesome. Unfortunately, the main attraction, multiplayer, is a pay-to-win dumpster fire with some of the worst map design ever seen in AAA gaming. The multiplayer isn't just bad, it's offensive. The single player has its moments and for what it's worth is very unique. It's a relief to know there is a decent futuristic COD campaign out there. Zombies, while a great rendition, is out of place in an Infinity Ward game, and I can't give it too much credit because again, just the one map, even if it is a damn good one. It's safe to say that Infinite Warfare didn't live up to either Infinity Wards or the fanbase's expectations. The developers tried to convince people that this is it, this is the new direction, but all we really saw was a carbon copy of Black Ops 3 and everything Treyarch implemented. Four years later, what remains is nothing more than a curiosity, a warning to those who would stray from the path of light, turn away from their past, and tread into the realm of shadow. And that is why Call of Duty Infinite Warfare was so awesome and bad. Thank you all for watching, hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to sign up for private internet access by using the link on screen and in the description. Protect yourself for less than $3 a month and get three months free. Alright everyone, that's all I got for today. This is the Act Man, signing out. Peace!